Welcome fellow alumni. I'm Donna McPhee. I graduated from Columbia College in 1989 and I'm the president of the Columbia Alumni Association and vice president for alumni relations at the university. We're so glad you've joined us today. Tonight we're joined by Jeanette Wing, the Avanesian's director of the Science Institute and professor of computer science at Columbia University. Jeanette is a leader in computer science, known for her research contributions in cybersecurity and privacy, formal methods, distributed and concurrent systems, and programming languages. Her seminal essay titled Computational Thinking was published more than a decade ago and is credited with helping establish the centrality of computer science to problem solving in all disciplines which has influenced college and K through 12 curricula worldwide. Jeanette has been recognized with distinguished service awards from the Computing Research Association and the Association for Computing Machinery. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Association for Computing Machinery, and the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. She holds bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees from MIT. Near the end of the program, we'll have an audience Q&A. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can in the time that we have. I'm now so privileged to welcome Jeanette Wing to Columbia at Home. Hello everyone, thank you Donna for that introduction. I'm Jeanette Wing and I'm the director of the Data Science Institute at Columbia University. Today I'm going to talk to you about data for good, ensuring the responsible use of data to benefit society. I wanna start my presentation with the big picture of the data life cycle. We generate lots and lots of data. Uh, in fact, the scientific community has been generating lots and lots of data for decades. If you think about the human genome project in the turn of the century, or a, a large telescopes that generate lots and lots of data, or neutrino detectors in the South Pole, these scientific instruments have been generating lots and lots of data for many, many years. I think what's, what's really new in data science and the generation of data is that we people are generating lots and lots of data through everything that we do online, every even physical interaction that we do that someone keeps track of, um, and of course, everywhere we go with our cell phones. So that is what is exciting about data science um, and the kind of data that we're generating. Of course, we generate data, but we need to collect the data. Not all data that's generated is collected. And then we process this data. In this step, I include everything from encryption to compression to more mundane data science tasks like data cleaning and data wrangling. Once we process the data, we store it in some kind of electronic medium usually. Um, and that is um, where we uh, store the, the bits, if you will, uh, for future retrieval. We use data management techniques coming out of databases um, to store the data in, in an efficient manner so that later when we need to retrieve the data, we can get access quickly. The step called data analysis is why data science is uh, so exciting and hot these days. Um, in particular, a lot of the artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques um, that are based on both computational and statistical methods go into the step called data analysis. And then we also have to, once we analyze the data, actually visualize our results. Um, and it was really not until I joined Columbia University and I talked to my colleagues in the journalism school when I came to appreciate what I call the data interpretation step. Uh, the journalists call it storytelling. And the point is, it's not enough to show a pie chart or a bar graph. You have to actually tell a story about what it is you're looking at. And then, of course, there's a human at the end 
um, who wants to take this story or the results of your analysis and do some something interesting with it, take a decision, uh, take an action, um, or make a policy. And throughout the data life cycle, I want to emphasize the importance of privacy and ethical concerns um, in every stage of the data life cycle. So what is data science? I'm sure many of you are asking this question. I have a very succinct definition of what data science is. Data science is the study of extracting value from data. And there are two very important words in this definition. The most important word is value. Value, of course, is subject to the interpretation of the end user. So if you're a scientist, value is advancing knowledge, discovering something you didn't know before. If you're a business person, value is actually calculable. It's how much accrues to your bottom line. That's how many of the IT companies make um, a lot of money. They make a lot of money on our data, which we provide them, whether we know it or like it or, or not. The second important word in this definition is extracting, because it takes a lot of effort to extract that value from the data. So I want to share with you the three-part mission statement I have of the Data Science Institute at Columbia University. The first is to advance the state of the art in data science. This is really about pushing the frontiers of basic research in data science. And what's interesting about data science is that it itself is a new emerging discipline. So we at Columbia University and the whole academic community in data science is actually still defining what this discipline means. The second part of my mission statement speaks to the breadth and full-fledged nature of Columbia University, and that is to transform all fields, professions, and sectors through the application of data science. Columbia has all fields, professions, and sectors, and what's so gratifying to me is working with people across the university um, who have a lot of interesting data and who come to me and ask for data science expertise because they understand the importance of how data science is going to transform their research and education aspects of their discipline. And finally, the third part of my mission statement is to ensure the responsible use of data to benefit society. There are really two important parts to this statement. One is to benefit society, and that is really to tackle societal grand challenges. We're actually or, you know, living two of the, the biggest societal grand challenges right now, one being healthcare and the other being social justice. But other societal grand challenges include, of course, climate change, energy, um, and so on. And of course, faculty, students, and, and staff at the Columbia University are inspired on, uh, to study these very, very tough problems. The second part of the statement is ensure the responsible use of data. And this is where I include the privacy and ethical concerns about the use of data. And I summarize my mission statement into this three word tagline, data for good. Data to do good for society and humanity and using data in a good manner. So everyone on the line, this is my tagline. Please remember that data science at Columbia means data for good. So we are a truly collaborative institute. We are university level and university wide. We collaborate with every single school, college, and institute on campus. We have 300, over 350 affiliated faculty coming from all the different schools, colleges, and institutes, including Barnard and Teachers College, as you'll see. Um, but all the departments in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, in the Engineering School, um, we have colleagues from the Business School, Journalism, SEPA, the Law School, and many, many colleagues from the medical campus. So we truly are very collaborative. And one of the fun parts of my job is what I call connecting the dots, um, introducing someone from epidemiology to someone in architecture who are actually working on very similar problems. One uh, program that we run jointly with Columbia Entrepreneurship um, speaks to this kind of collaboration at the education level. We have been partnering with Columbia Entrepreneurship to fund faculty uh, who come together from different disciplines and design and implement and execute 
on courses, new courses for the, the students at all levels um, that would otherwise not uh, have been in, uh, designed. So one example is a data science past, present, and future course, which is offered to all undergraduates. And this is co-taught by an applied math professor and a history professor. Um, another example is what the business school did a few years ago. Uh, it designed an eight course sequence of data science uh, courses. And now over 50% of all Columbia Business School students graduate with some data science knowledge. And this is quite a significant number. They're actually constrained only by capacity. I think eventually that could be 100%. But this really speaks to the students know what they need to know for their future. We have a robust industry affiliates program. We represent many sectors, finance, of course, but IT, of course, but even retail, pharmaceutical, um, publishing, um, and so on. We also are quite international. You'll recognize three Chinese companies there, Alibaba, Baidu, and DD. Uh, we have a Brazilian company and a Spanish company as well. Um, and for those of you who work for a company, we're always looking for new affiliates. So please let us know if you would like to join. We also have a special relationship with IBM. This is a center on blockchain and data transparency that we set up uh, two years ago. Um, and it is, uh, 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 although it has a name on blockchain and data transparency, it really looks at the big question of what is the value of data, not just from a technical point of view, but from a business, economic, and policy point of view. So what I wanted to do in my remaining time with you is to just share some research stories. Um, all of these stories are based on research being done by faculty, students, and postdocs at Columbia University. And it goes to show the breadth and depth of data science research uh, at the university. So let me just start with one story about advancing the state of the art in data science. And this question, or the problem that uh, this postdoc and a uh, faculty member are addressing is the problem of multiple causal inference. Um, people have uh, probably, for those of you who are familiar with AI and machine learning, people have criticized machine learning for just a showing association or correlation, but not causality. But if you think about the world of healthcare and economics and political science, people want causality. They don't want just correlation or association. So classical causal inference considers univariate causes, for example, whether a subject receives a drug or control. The problem that these researchers address is different. It considers a situation where there are multiple causes for an effect. And it turns out that this not only is a common scenario, but it's an easier problem to solve with weaker assumptions than for classical causal inference. So let me actually just give you a concrete example. Suppose I were um, a producer and I want to understand the causal effect of putting an actor into a movie. I have to make casting decisions and I want to predict the expected revenue. If I put Sean Connery in a James Bond movie, will I make more money than if I put in Roger Moore? So my goal is to estimate the expected revenue for a particular cast A. And I basically need to estimate the population distribution of the outcome function y of a, and thus for a particular cast a. Now the naive approach is to fit a regression from actors to revenue. Um, this estimates how much revenue changes when an actor is included. The problem is there may be what's called unobserved confounders. These are variables that affect the cast or the causes and the revenue, the effect. For example, the genre of a movie could be a confounder. After all, action movies make more money than artsy movies. Whether a movie is a sequel or not is a confounder. And some actors, when appearing together, might together generate more revenue than if only one were cast, and so on and so on. So this has been the sticky point with calls of reasoning, the presence of confounders. And let me just say that this application, there are many applications of, cause, of uh, ca causal inference where you're concerned about multiple causes. 
whether it's how do genes affect a trait, how do sports players affect how well a team is doing, or how do prices of items affect how much money is spent. So in the classical way of doing causal inference, we um, have to, uh, we understand that confounders can affect both the causes and the outcomes. And so we need to correct for all the co confounders. Um, unfortunately, uh, this uh, correcting for all the confounders makes a strong assumption that we have no unobserved confounders, which means we have to think and think and think and then decide, okay, there are no more confounders and then we can do a calculation. The problem with this assumption is that it's not testable. So we're only as good as we can think that we've found all the unobserved, uh, all the confounders. So here's the new idea. The new idea is actually to build a model, and I'll just call it model, uh, there's a fancy term for it, um, which will allow us to basically capture the population distribution of possible causes, then that essentially discovers a variable that captures all the multiple cause confounders. And this allows us to construct a model that has two um, nice properties. One is that it has a weaker assumption. We only have to assume that there are no unobserved single cause confounders as opposed to no observed all confounders. And the second is that it's actually testable. The model that we build, we can check whether it's a good one or not. And if we don't like it, we can build a different one. So back to movies, um, if I run the deconfounder on that data set I showed you before, we would see that Sean Connery, the actor who plays James Bond, his value goes up, and the actors who play the characters M and Q, their values go down. What this means is without the deconfounder, Sean Connery's value was underestimated, and Bernard Lee's and Desmond Lewin's values were overestimated. And this kind of makes sense, because after all, we go to see a James Bond movie very likely because, we, because of the person playing James Bond. And unfortunately, <clears throat> the characters who play, the actors who play M and Q are not as well remembered or recognized. The other beauty of this is once we build this model, because we're doing causal inference, we can ask and answer a lot of other what if questions. So that's just one example of a kind of um, basic research project that we do at the Data Science Institute that advances the state of the art in data science. Now let me turn, and I will tell each of these stories much more quickly, um, to transforming all fields, professions, and sectors by giving examples of the variety of fields that people use at Columbia using data science. And I'm gonna start with a, an obvious discipline, and that's biology. Biology and big data, as I mentioned earlier, uh, have been going hand to hand for a, a couple decades now. In this particular work, um, people, the researchers were looking at the <clears throat> genome, genomic sequence of the microbiome around the pancreatic cancer tumor cell. What they discovered is the microbiome was counteracting the effect of the chemotherapy treatment for the tumor, and thus making it ineffective. So that's not good. What they further then discovered is that if you inject in the tumor cell an antibiotic, then that would counteract, counteract the effect of the microbiome, therefore making the chemotherapy effective. Uh, so that's a good thing. The second example comes from our astrophysics um, colleagues interacting with our computer science colleagues. And I'm always in, I, I always admire the astronomers and astrophysicists because they are very keen to um, use um, very modern techniques to try anything uh, to analyze the data that they have. In this particular case, they're using state-of-the-art convolutional neural networks to analyze the weak gravitational lens data that they get from um, looking at the sky, looking at the universe. And what they found is that these convolutional neural networks were better estimators of the coefficients of a particular Big Bang model um, and 
better than off the shelf statistical techniques. And so this was a, a, a bit surprising and showed some positive interest in state of the art AI and machine learning techniques. And I wanted to say something um, about economics and machine learning or big data and economics more generally. As I mentioned earlier, when I talked about causal inference, economists don't want to just know about uh, what two variables are correlated or associated. They want to know cause and effect. And it was my time when I was at Microsoft running research for Microsoft that I really came to appreciate the collision happening between economics and machine learning and the power of bringing causal reasoning to the machine learning community and bringing big data to the economics community um, to the point where it made a huge difference for the company. Now, I, in this particular work, I'm talking about some work where um, a lot of data collected about online marketplaces, in particular Amazon Mechanical Turk, was studying what the model, the economic model of these online marketplaces are like. And it turns out that they're like monopsonies. Uh, monopsonies when you have one buyer and multiple sellers, um, as opposed to a monopoly where you have one seller and multiple buyers. But the, the point is that this is actually a surprising result. It was not expected. Um, and there were other uh, data uh, analysis done on that um, uh, Mechanical Turk date, uh, data set that uh, showed some other surprises. In finance, which is, of course, a great strength of Columbia, um, in this particular project, uh, the researchers are looking at how to automate um, uh, adv personal advising of um, how to invest your money. So if you happen to be wealthy, you have a personal advisor, and over time, and usually time means months or years, your personal advisor learns your investment preferences and also your aversion to risk. So in robo-advising, you're automating all of that and using a technique called reinforcement learning, you can basically learn uh, investors' preferences um, automatically in just a few uh, iterations of the algorithm. Uh, we have a very, quote, modern history department with many of the faculty very eager to use state-of-the-art data science methods to understand uh, usually text but other media um, in documents that they study in, in history. In this particular example, um, history professors were looking at cablegrams sent um, among ambassadors in the 1970s and just analyzing the text in the cablegrams to see if they can discover, quote, interesting events, which would correspond to interesting historical events. And sure enough, using state-of-the-art techniques like topic modeling, they were able to distinguish topics describing business as usual from those that deviate from such patterns, and those are the interesting events. So you're, every black dot here is an, quote, interesting event, and you'll notice a couple of them you probably are familiar to you, like the <clears throat> evacuation of Saigon or the death of Mao Zedong. So now I want to turn to the third part of my mission statement where I talk about data for good, responsible use of data, and to benefit society. For responsible use of data, I want to first preface by what I mean by responsible. And I, my thinking about this topic has really evolved in the past three years um, as the technology has evolved and as this um, use of this technology in making decisions that people have um, been deployed at scale um, and, and in some cases to, to our alarm. So first I wanna talk about what I mean by you know, responsible use. And I like to use this phrase trustworthy AI to capture all the characteristics that we would like of AI or data science, machine learning techniques. And this set of properties I've listed here, fairness, accountability, transparency, ethics, robustness, interpretability, explainability, these are all important. They're hard, some of them are hard to formalize, you know, write a mathematical definition of, but they're all important. And, um, and these are actually new properties that the computer science community hasn't actually had to think about 
until AI has come along and become much more mainstream. Um, so trustworthy AI really builds on decades of research in trustworthy computing, where it, trustworthy computing systems have always come, has always come to mean safety, security, privacy, reliability, availability, and usability. The point really is AI systems are pushing um, the limits of what, what it is, what it even means to be trustworthy. Um, so what I wanted to do is just give you a couple of examples, one on safety and one on robustness. And remember, these are examples of research done here at Columbia University um, by our faculty and students. So in safety, um, this is a canonical, uh, you know, deep learning system. Um, and a typical problem that these deep learning systems have is that it's very easy to fool the system um, into misclassifying an image, for instance. So in this particular case, on the left, um, the deep learning system correctly classifies um, the image that the self-driving car sees and directs the car to veer to the left and avoid an accident. But it turns out that it's possible to perturb these images in very natural ways, like darkening the image. And then the deep learning system will misclassify uh, the image in such a way it tells a self-driving car to veer to the right, go over the guardrail, and a fatal accident could occur. So Deep Explore is a way to systematically generate and test a deep learning system, generate input images and test deep learning systems against those generated images. Another example, uh, this is a, a nice example of addressing robustness. Um, here's a, a, a cartoon of a deep learning system. And here's the same problem where it could uh, be fooled to misclassify, for instance, a stop sign into a yield sign. And in this particular work, the researchers uh, very cleverly use a completely different idea coming from a different part of data science um, called differential privacy. Um, and they use that notion of differential privacy to make this deep learning system more robust. And what they basically do is add a layer of noise that you can control to ensure a provable guarantee of how robust this particular deep learning system will be with respect to perturbations to the input. Now let me um, close with a couple of examples of how data for good uh, tackles societal grand challenges. Let me start with something um, very obvious, which is climate change. This is, of course, very important for all of us. Um, and I, I specifically wanted to talk about this example because someone in the pre-questions that I got asked about open source. This is a very large project. It's completely open source. In fact, it's layers of open source software that uh, have been developed here at Columbia and with our colleagues elsewhere. Um, and it's basically providing a platform for climate scientists to share their data, share their models, share their algorithms, and share their results. Um, and this is uh, sponsored by many agencies and organizations. More specifically, with a result on the use of data science um, and how it it's influence, can influence, potentially influence policy, I wanted to share with you this uh, story that uh, the data scientists looked at data from uh, India and looked at particularly the uh, planting of six different grains uh, in India and what and they wanted to show that if there are extreme events like droughts or it changes into the volume of water during a monsoon season these extreme weather events can greatly affect um, the yields of each of these crops and the main point of this uh, work was to say that India right now is highly reliant on rice and if they do not diversify um, and plant um, other grains where it makes sense to, then they could be vulnerable to um, a, a disastrous events uh, happening because of the weather and climate. And the last story I wanted to share with you has to do with healthcare. This is an enormous uh, federated data set 
um, of right now 500 million unique patient records that represents um, you know 25 uh, 80 databases from 25 different countries and Columbia University is the coordinating center of this we call it Odyssey uh, because it's easy to pronounce uh, it stands for Observational Health Data Sciences Informatics. I want to show you a few results from the Odyssey data set. They studied three different diseases, diabetes, hypertension, and depression. And you'll see these rings of rings, circle of rings. And the way to interpret this, and now I'm doing the storytelling because it's a beautiful data visualization, but you would understand it without the story. Um, if you look at CUMC, this is Columbia Medical School, the ring, uh, rings of circles for hypertension, each radius here represents a patient, you'll see that in the inner ring, um, there's a particular drug uh, given hydrochlorothiazide, uh, represented by the orange color. Um, and if that works, then that's fine. But if it doesn't work, a second drug is administered, and that's represented by the second ring. And if that doesn't work, a third drug is administered and, and so on and so forth. And I, uh, these diagrams cut off after four rings. Um, what was interesting is that if I collapsed all the different um, rings of circles for the entire database for hypertension, one result that they, that's based on only observational data now that the researchers found is that one fourth of the people treated for hypertension in this data set are treated uniquely, one fourth. That I think is an amazing uh, number. But that basically says that if you're in that one fourth and you have hypertension and I'm your doctor and you say, Jeanette, is there anyone else in the world being treated for hypertension like me? The answer would be no. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'll move on. And just one last uh, story to really bookend the first story, and that is, of course, when you have such a large data set uh, and people in the healthcare industry care about causality, not just correlation and association, um, our researchers got together and built a medical deconfounder. Um, and just one quick result here in looking at type 2 di diabetes, they basically show that some drugs, um, the deconfounder, reduces both false positive and false negative rates. So some drugs go from being initially considered causal to non-causal, for instance, acetaminophen, which is uh, like aspirin, and other drugs go the other way that they initially thought were non-causal, but in fact, they're, they showed it, they're shown to be causal. Now it's hard to validate these kinds of results, um, but the best they could do was actually show that the deconfounder identifies effective causal drugs that are more consistent with the medical literature. So I'm going to stop now, uh, data for good, and I'll take questions. Um, thank you so much, Jeanette. Um, first of all, I love your tagline, um, data for good, um, certainly during this unprecedented time. Um, it has even more impact. And thank you so much for sharing um, everything that uh, is happening with the Data Science Institute and with Columbia. Um, it's always amazing to me. Um, I've been, I joined the Columbia community in 1985 and I keep, and I've been part of the administration since 2008, but there is just so much going on at our institution and within our community. Um, and it's so wonderful for you to have shared that with this group tonight. Um, but I now want to turn it over to Q&A and hear from the audience. Um, and remember, everyone, that you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and send in your questions. Um, so here we go. From Jonathan Steinberg, given the prestige of Teachers College in the educational community, what thoughts have you had regarding DSI partnerships in education with the involvement of assessment and how much educators are looking for data to help better teach their students in K through 12 in the higher education, especially in this time of a pandemic? It's a great question. And in fact, we are collaborating with Teachers College on exactly um, that kind of question when one can collect a lot of data 
um, based on um, you know a, a lot of these online learning platforms uh, to know very fine grained information about where students are struggling, where students are doing well. Um, this this is the ultimate uh, you know use of data to to improve our understanding of how students learn. Um, and so the Teachers College has actually been hiring recently faculty who are very interested in this topic. Um, another way that we have engaged with Teachers College is we last summer um, worked with Teachers College to teach the teachers um, locally uh, data science. And so they brought in a, a lot of uh, high school teachers and we helped teach them data science so that they can go back and teach their students. Wonderful. From Kodiak Soled, what does data for good mean in terms of racial justice? What does it look like? This is uh, clearly another timely and hugely important topic. Um, I should mention that the Data Science Institute um, is actually putting together a, a, a task force that will address racial equity. And we intend to have an action plan um, from this task force by the end of the summer, early fall. The Data Science Institute, I think, can play a very important role in addressing racial equity. Um, I want to actually raise a, a somewhat technical point um, that I think is particularly germane to data science. Uh, many of you might have heard of things like um, biased algorithms or uh, discrimination of machine learning models and so on. This is a very real problem. This is a very real problem that the research community understands. Um, and the problem comes uh, is because these machine learning models that we are deploying to make decisions about people, and we're making decisions about whether we have cancer or not, or whether someone should get a bail or not, whether someone should get a loan or not. In fact, you know, uh, any, any very important scarce resource a decision. The, the, when we build these models, we're using data. We're using data to build these models. Where does that data come from? It comes from all the data that we collect, that we've been generating, um, historical data. So th think about a bank loan. If I build a model to determine, should I give a loan to this customer? and I use data based on the history of all the loans I've given in the past, then I'm going to build a model that reflects all the decisions I've made in the past. And if I've made biased decisions, then my model isn't going to be any better than me. It will in fact reflect that bias. And so the academic community very much understands this. This is one of the reasons that you heard that IBM and Amazon and Microsoft are very are pulling back the uh, use of facial recognition technology, for instance, for police departments, be because they recognize that the technologies that they are building, these really super duper facial rec recognition technologies, are based on, if you will, bias data. They may have more pictures, images of white males. And so if they don't have enough um, images to train the model on a diverse population of people, then the model is going to be biased. So this is, this is partly what I mean by fairness, um, which is of course a very elusive, hard to nail down uh, concept. Um, but this is the questioner, the person who asked the question asked a very, very timely and important question that the research community is still grappling with. Thank you. From Edward Mullen, what is the relationship at Columbia between data science for good and the Columbia School of Social Work, focus on social justice and advancing social welfare? Social so we, we obviously intersect. Um, uh, one of the focus areas for the data science is social justice. And we work very closely with uh, faculty in the School of Social Work. Uh, in fact, the um, uh, the task force on racial equity that I mentioned ju just now, it will be co-chaired by a faculty member uh, from the School of Social Work. Um, and 
so we we absolutely share um, an inter interest in uh, assuring social justice. Uh, the Data Science Institute, because it's so broad, also addresses other societal grand challenges, like I mentioned, healthcare um, or climate. Okay, um, next I'm looking at a question from Florencia Velez Cortez. Thank you for the great presentation, Dr. Wing. Currently, it seems that a big hurdle in contact tracing efforts is a lack of public trust in data collection efforts. What can data scientists do to address the concerns of the public over the safety and privacy of their data? This is another excellent question that really brings out the point, this tension between privacy and utility. This is a, a very known um, tension in the privacy literature um, and contact tracing uh, just uh, makes, makes it visceral. So obviously we would want, in order to do the contract, contact tracing um, as, as thoroughly as possible, you need to know the identity of the people you've been interacting with. Um, and therefore somehow you need to know, um, you know, they, they, may, they, need to, they are informed that they might have come into contact with someone and you know, they may even feel that their privacy was violated. How did you even know that? Um, and so that, that uh, on the other hand, you know, in order to get some control over the pandemic, contact tracing clearly uh, has shown a lot of benefit. There are studies that are um, showing a very recent study that showed a perhaps a counterintuitive result. Um, so there are some contact tracing apps out there that are completely decentralized, which try to preserve the identity of the individuals so that other individuals don't find out um, who those people are. But the people who have been contacted are uh, informed uh, and in a completely decentralized manner. It turns out that in this particular study, which only looked at six apps and it was only one study, it showed that it, the public actually trust centralized versions of contact tracing um, where some organization, let's say the government, um, collects the data, uh, keeps it secure, of course, gives it uh, only the relevant people access to that data, and then contact, contacts the people who need to know. Um, so the counterintuitive result is that you would think people would trust the decentralized version over the centralized, but in fact, that wasn't the result. But it was just one result, six apps, one study. Thanks, Jeanette. Kurt DeSoto says, once again, great presentation. Could you tell us anything about how the analyses might change depending on whether the data is subjective versus objective? For example, data about what folks are writing about on internet blogs versus data received from monitoring devices, such as devices monitoring weather conditions or water temperature. I, you know, that's a new question. I have not thought uh, that not gotten that question before, but I think it's a very interesting one. Um, there's a there's a variation of that which I'll just throw out there, which is um, I would say fake news or facts. Um, the data from the instruments that you're measuring are facts, and we don't question them. Um, and the only you know, technical challenges are sometimes they're noisy or incomplete or imprecise, and we kind of have statistical techniques to deal with that. The data that's subjective, and I'll say fake news just to, to shorten the conversation, that is, that has turned out to be much, much harder, much, much harder than the technical community thought in terms of solving. So I remember, Less than three years ago, I was on an advisory committee for, for DARPA, and we were talking about putting a workshop together on fighting fake news. And you know, typical technical people think, oh, we'll just throw more technology at it. Well, that's, that's clearly not working. Um, and even when a company like Facebook puts human beings on it, like editors, um, that's not enough. It doesn't scale, and it's subjective as well. So I think what, you know, this is, 
another, in some sense, um, unintended consequence of the development of technology. And now we technology people have to deal with it and do our best to counter it. Um, so I don't really have a good answer to that, but it's a very good point. Um, from an, an anonymous attendee, how is Columbia using data to serve the disability community, the visually impaired, et cetera? Um, I, I have to be very honest. I saw that question and I, I don't, uh, what I can say is that uh, data science as most technologies um, know they need to serve all the populations and including visually impaired. Um, I think that there's probably not enough being done to study that particular population. Um, there's, I think the, a lot of work, for instance, in image analysis um, may or may not be serving the visually impaired. Um, what I can say is that there's a huge amount of work being done in what's called natural language processing. In fact, Columbia University is one of the a key um, uh, centers in natural language processing. We have a critical mass of faculty who are experts in NLP. And NLP is a technique that allows you to analyze text, speech, um, all sorts of things that the visually impaired would care about in terms of communicating with others. Um, so we, uh, in fact, we just hired a new faculty member in this area, um, and it is one of the core strengths of Columbia NLP. Thank you. From Kevin Roy, regarding bias data, are you saying that big data is suffering from the same limitations that clinical investigations have suffered from for this year, i.e. using young white males almost exclusively as the test subjects for drug trials? And in that case, how do you grapple with the unknown confounders? This, this is, there's a, theoretically, you, you, for the multiple causal inference case I discussed, um, if you're going to use classical causal inference, as I mentioned, you have to assume you've identified all the confounders. And if there are unknown confounders by definition, you have not identified it. And therefore your results are only as good as your assumptions, only as good as those confounders you have um, identified and, and then done the analysis on. The point of the multiple causal inference uh, work that I showed you is that with a weaker assumption, instead of assuming you've found, you've identified all the confounders, you only need to assume you've identified all the unobserved all the single confounders, that there are no unobserved single confounders, then you can actually do with this calculation, you have a better model, you can actually prove that the result is unbiased, et cetera, et cetera. So this is why it's a very promising technique, because in fact, in reality, multiple causal inference is more the norm than it is a classical single causal inference problem. So, you know, there's no, there's no free lunch here. It's a weaker assumption, but it's, there's still an assumption. Thank you. There have been so many wonderful questions. It's hard for us to choose as we're going through them, but I do, I think this is an important one um, and uh, it will be our last question um, of the night, but um, for, and for some of you, it may be the morning, um, but do encourage all of you to stay connected and continue to share questions with us. But from Yasmin Khan, what opportunities do you see for people to pursue data science careers without coding backgrounds in the legal perfection, profession to have better outcomes for an, an access to justice perspective? Well, maybe you're not gonna like my answer. <laughs> so um, as, as Donna introduced me, um, I'm, I'm known for being an advocate of what I call computational thinking, um, where I believe people, everyone, every walk of life, every pr profession should learn some concepts of computing. Um, now that's not to say everyone needs to learn how to code, um, but I can say that for data science, um, to really be proficient and understand the, um, 
what you can do with data science. Having some coding skills, either using R, which is a statistical package, or understanding how to code in Python, that would be, that would be really advantageous. And I, when I mentioned that 50% of the MBAs coming out of Columbia Business School have had some exposure to data science, partly that means they learn how to code. And, be, and it's not that they're gonna code on the job, but they realize that if they understand how computation can open up the possibility of scaling up techniques, dealing with large, large, large amounts of data, and discovering hypotheses that no human being could ever pose because you're analyzing large data. That's the power. That is the power of data science. Jeanette, that was truly wonderful. I'm sure uh, everybody is giving you applause virtually. We're so grateful for your taking the time with us um, to share the what's happening with the Data Science Institute with your work and certainly um, with Data for Good. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this opportunity, Donna, and thank you all for listening. Um, so I'm here to give a little commercial for our next event, which will be the Noble Grapes, a wine tasting overview with three members of the Columbia Alumni Association's Wine Industry Network. That will be on July 8th at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Please visit alumni.columbia.edu for the most up-to-date information on Columbia at home. Uh, we'll be off next week to recognize the July 4th holiday. We're so grateful for all of you for participating, sending in questions. Please keep the questions coming. Send us any ideas you may have for future webinars. And thank you so much for being an important part of not only our alumni community, but the entire university community. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye.